So we are venturing into chapter 15, and this is one of my favorite topics, organometallic reagents. Organometallic reagents are carbon-based nucleophiles. So last semester we learned a lot of different types of nucleophiles, um, but this one is particularly useful because we can form carbon-carbon bonds. So this is what they are. They're going to be where carbon has a negative charge on it, and it can attack some electrophile. So either we can attack a carbon that has a group pulling electron density away from it, or we can attack a carbonyl. So we know we can draw a resonance structure of this where there is a partially positive charge on that carbon. And again, it's very useful because we're going to be forming carbon-carbon bonds. Okay, so what do these look like and how do we make them? Um, you guys are actually going to make this in organic lab, um, two labs from now. And what we're going to do is we're going to take any alkyl halide and then take magnesium metal. We're going to heat it up in some ethereal solvent. So the ethereal solvent helps stabilize the Grignard reagent. The oxygen has lone pairs on it that can coordinate to the metal. And you get something that looks like this. And in this case, our carbon, whatever our R group is, is going to be more electronegative than the metal, so the carbon is actually going to have the partially negative charge on it. So we can consider this a, a polar covalent bond, but depending on that electronegativity difference, it behaves or the way it reacts is kind of like an ionic bond. So the way it reacts is going to be where we have a negative charge sitting on the carbon, our nucleophile, and a positive charge on the metal. So of the alkyl halides that we can use, alkyl iodides are going to be the most reactive, but again, we can use any alkyl halide we want. All right, let's look at some examples of how we form these. In this case, we take an alkyl chloride, we can mix it with um, magnesium metal, in this case we're using diethyl ether as our solvent, and this is the carbon nucleophile we get. Okay, so again, since this is a carbanion, it behaves as if the negative charge is sitting, or the electron density from this bond is sitting on that carbon. Okay, um, We don't just have to use alkyl halides, we can use aryl halides as well. Um, so Grignard reagents are so commonly used because we can start from relatively inexpensive reagents. So alkyl halides are relatively inexpensive. Um, another type of organometallic reagent is an organolithium reagent. It reacts in the same way, so we have an electronegativity difference between carbon and lithium, so it's a carbanion. The big difference between this and a Grignard reagent is that an organolithium reagent is a lot more reactive, or meaning that the electronegativity difference between carbon and lithium is greater. In this case, we usually use a nonpolar solvent, so something like hexanes instead of ether. And this is how we make them. So starting from an alkyl halide, just like we do with the Grignard reagent, adding in lithium metal in a nonpolar solvent, and in this case, we made n-butyl lithium. So these reagents are pyrophorics, meaning they react violently with water. So when we're working with these in the lab, we have to use special equipment to do it. One way is by using what's called a glove box. So this entire box is filled with either nitrogen or argon gas, so something inert. So you can perform all your reactions in here without exposing anything to air and moisture. And you get to put your hands in these pretty cool gloves as well. Another way that we're going to see in organic lab is by using something called a Schlenk line. So in a Schlenk line, what we have is two different tubes. We have a vacuum line and we have another tube that provides either nitrogen or argon gas. And you can take each one of these individual hosings and you can connect your reaction to that. And it's another way to exclude air and moisture. Okay, so here's a pretty cool setup with that um, where you see everything is sealed off. So if you did your locker checkout, that's where all these rubber septa are for. Okay, and everything is closed off from the air and moisture.
So how do we use these in reactions? We said that they can be carbon-based, or they are carbon-based nucleophiles. So one type of electrophile we can use is an epoxide. All right. If you think back to last semester, what we learned is that if we're under basic conditions, so since these are nucleophiles, they're also basic, we're going to open up our epoxide on our least substituted side, or the side that's the most accessible. Okay. What happens is the electrons from this bond are going to attack that carbon. And now we would have too many bonds to carbon, so we have to break a bond, and that puts a negative charge on oxygen. One thing that we learned in lab is that if we want to isolate something with a charge on it, we can neutralize it. And in this case, since we have a negative charge on oxygen, we can use aqueous acid to neutralize it. And this is what we call a workup in a lab. Okay. So here's an example of where we have a three carbon chain. And again, we're going to open up on the least substituted side. We'll break this bond, put the electrons on oxygen to give us this. It's called an alkoxide. And then we can do an aqueous acid workup to isolate the alcohol. So if we're thinking about this in synthesis, when do I know that I need to do an epoxide opening? So one great way to know is that in my product, I am forming an alcohol. And on top of that, I'm adding in carbons. Okay, so that's one good way to recognize um, being able to use this tool. I'm forming an alcohol and I'm adding in carbons. Okay. The last type of organometallic reagent I want to talk about is something called an organocuprate. So the formula looks like this. And in terms of how it reacts, it reacts just like a Grignard or an organolithium reagent, but it's much, much milder. So meaning that the electronegativity difference between carbon and copper is a lot smaller. Okay? We can form these organocuprate reagents um, another name for them is a Gilman reagent from an organolithium reagent. And we can mix it with copper iodide. And this is just solvent. This is tetrahydrofuran. It's an ethereal solvent. And what we get is this. So of this organocuprate, even though we have two of these carbon groups attached, only one is going to actually transfer and act as a nucleophile. Okay. With the organocuprates, we have two different reactions that we can um, do. The first is we can do an epoxide opening. So just like with an organomagnesium reagent or um, an organolithium reagent, only difference is this is a lot milder. So the first step is opening up on the least substituted side. We're forming a negative charge on oxygen. And then we can do some aqueous acid workup to isolate the alcohol. Okay, so ammonium chloride um, aqueous is just another way to do an acidic workup. So I recommend pausing the video and going through that mechanism, making sure you understand how the electrons flow. The second reaction we can do is a coupling reaction that forms a carbon-carbon bond. And what we can do with this is we can take the organocuprate, we can take another alkyl halide here, and we form a carbon-carbon bond. So imagine we can take any two combinations, put these together, and form a carbon-carbon bond. So this is one of the most widely used reactions. So cross-coupling chemistry is just a whole field in itself. Um, and because it's so useful, chemists won the, the Nobel Prize for cross-coupling chemistry in um, recent years. So this is a widely used method to form carbon-carbon bonds. One other thing I'd like to talk about is um, what if we have a group in our molecule that has an acidic hydrogen on it? Okay, If we're using carbon-based nucleophiles, they're also basic, so they can also deprotonate instead of act as a nucleophile. Right? If we have an acidic hydrogen, like one on an alcohol, and we want to use a nucleophile in the presence of it, our problem is it could be deprotonated. So we can employ something called a protecting group. OK, 
okay? One of the most commonly used protecting groups for alcohols are silo protecting groups or making a silo ether. And the reason why they're so widely used is they're easy to put on, okay? They're very robust, meaning they stand up to pretty harsh conditions and you can also take them off pretty easily. So this way, the, the way this works is that we can protect our alcohol using a chlorosilane and a little bit of base. Then we can do whatever reaction we want to do. And the last step is we can use a fluoride source to take the silo group off. See how this would actually work or when we would want to use this. Let's say I wanted to do an alkylation of an alkyne. So I want to deprotonate this hydrogen and I want to add on this alkyl group. If we think about the base that we generally use for this, we use something called sodium amide. It's a relatively strong base. And then we get a negative charge here. We can add in an alkyl halide to do the alkylation. The problem is if we employ sodium amide, we have to think about pKa's. The one on the alcohol is around 16 and the one on the hydrogen is around 25. So if we add sodium amide, our alcohol is going to be deprotonated first so we don't get the reactivity that we want. Right? So how could we use protecting groups in this case? Well, the first step is we know that this is the most acidic hydrogen, so we could first deactivate this alcohol to make it um, non-reactive. Okay? To do that, we employ the protecting group. Now we have something called a silo ether, and this is not going to react at all. So now we can go back and add our sodium amide to deprotonate this hydrogen, do the alkylation we want, and our very last step that we have to do is remove the protecting group. So fluorine and silicon form a very strong bond, so we can employ, this is called TBAF or tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride, to form a bond with silicon and we can get our alcohol back. So here's another example of when we would need to use a protecting group. So I want you to practice this example using retrosynthetic analysis working backwards. Figure out where you need to use that protecting group.